Hey everybody, welcome to our video on seismology. You might have often wondered, how do we know what the interior of the Earth is made of? If we can't get in there to get samples, we certainly can't tunnel down into it. A major way that we have information about the interior of Earth is from studying how seismic waves pass through the rock. Effectively, this, these seismic waves act like a kind of CAT scan or an X-ray of the interior of the Earth, giving us really important information about what it's made up of and helping us to make tectonic interpretations. So in this video, we're going to first try and understand what are seismic waves. We'll show that they're generated from earthquakes, there's multiple types of waves, and that the velocity of those waves is actually controlled by typically the composition or the density of the rocks the waves pass through. Then we'll switch gears and we'll look at seismic tomography, which is a way we can essentially model the seismic velocity structure of Earth's interior and help understand what it's made of. And we'll finish the video with a technique called seismic refraction, where we use reflections of seismic waves to also look at compositional boundaries within Earth. So the first thing to know is that um, seismic waves are very analogous to ripples in a pond after someone has thrown a stone into a quiet pond, expanding outwards in all directions. In, in this case, the initial energy, or the, the stone, comes from an earthquake. And what happens during earthquakes is that uh, because fault zones are locked, but the plates keep moving, rocks right along the fault actually get compressed, much like a spring might get compressed. Then, when the fault breaks and slips, that stored energy is released as the rock expands back to its original shape and the spring rebounds. At that moment, a, a wave of compressional energy is essentially radiated in all directions from the fault. And it's worth taking a quick look at this video which gives a cool example of how this might happen. This is a normal fault. It's locked. The rock is becoming compressed along the fault. Boom, there's the earthquake. And that compressed spring releases, and it sends off this, this wave of compression and dilation in all directions. And of course, in this example, that compression and dilation was measured by a lot of seismographs along the surface of the Earth. These seismic waves pass by compression and dilation, or what we would call a series of elastic displacements. Um, essentially, uh, as the earthquake starts, it may initially compress a parcel of rock, which then acts like a spring. It compresses temporarily, but then it actually expands again and compresses the rock parcel next to it, which compresses and expands, passing that wave downstream or down through rocks as this series of compressions and dilations. Um, and that's what you might feel during an earthquake, is actually the rock underneath you actually moving back and forth as this compression and dilation passes by you. Now, what I've just described is essentially correct for one type of seismic wave. That's called a P wave. Um, but there's actually two types of seismic waves. There's P waves, which pass by compression and dilation. And there's S waves, which pass essentially by displacing particles perpendicular to the wave path. So the analogy for a P wave might be a slinky where you start with a compression, and that compression and dilation passes through the slinky. The analogy for an S wave would be perhaps more akin to shaking a rope, where the first motion is actually up or down. And as the wave passes, it essentially is displacing particles along its path up or down relative to the, the trajectory the wave is moving in. So that's called a shear wave. Now, a very important difference is that P waves can pass through any material. Um, 
they can pass through air, they can pass through liquid. Any material that can be compressed and expanded can pass a P wave. In contrast, S waves cannot pass through gas or liquids. And that's essentially because gas or liquids have no rigidity. If you displace an atom of gas or an atom of liquid off to the side, there's no rigidity to bring it back. It just stays wherever it was displaced. So essentially, you can't have this wave motion passing through them because the displaced atoms or molecules can't return to where they were originally. So in sum, P waves pass through everything. S waves only pass through uh, rigid materials like rock. So we just talked about how to pass through a material. The material essentially has to be compressed and dilated or it has to be displaced in a shear wave. Now it turns out that waves can pass faster through materials that compress and dilate more quickly or that snap back to their original position more quickly in the case of a shear wave. And so this is really determined by a few factors. One is the density of the material. Denser materials pass waves more quickly. Um, the incompressibility of a material. Materials that are difficult to compress tend to pass waves downstream much faster. Um, and in the case of shear waves, rigidity. Uh, a wave will pass much more quickly through a stiff object, stiff material, than it will through a weak uh, flexible material or soft material. So density, incompressibility, and rigidity. Now those are physical properties of a material. Translating that into, into geology, what that means is that rocks that have different mineralogy or at a different pressure or a different temperature, all these factors are going to control the density, incompressibility, and rigidity. Right. So depending on what your rock is made of, what kind of pressure it's under and how hot it is uh, are big factors. And in particular, uh, hotter rocks tend to be less dense and more compressible. So hotter rocks tend to have slower velocities, all else being equal. In contrast, rocks that are under higher pressure uh, tend to be more dense and less compressible. So higher pressure tends to make uh, waves pass through faster. And so all of these factors come together to explain the velocity profile of seismic waves in Earth. Okay, So here is uh, depth in Earth in kilometers. So this is the very interior of the Earth. This is the very surface. Uh, here we have velocity on this axis of both P waves, or the compressional waves, and S waves, or the shear waves. And they have some things in common. For one, velocities of both increase with depth in the mantle. And that's primarily uh, a factor of the uh, pressure and density increase as you go downward in the mantle. Also notice that um, S waves actually do not pass through the liquid outer core. Because this is, is not a rigid material, it's a liquid, those S waves can't pass through, where the P waves can pass through. But notice the P wave velocity drops almost by half as they pass from the mantle into the liquid outer core. That's because this liquid outer core is not very compressible, right? It's hard, it doesn't compress well, um, and it's not very dense. So those waves go through much more slowly through that outer, that liquid outer core. And so it's these seismic velocities, of course, that tell us the nature of Earth's interior. This is how we know for sure that Earth's outer core is in fact liquid. I'm, I'm including these equations in here for the P wave and the S wave velocity. You don't need to know them, but I want you to have them in your records uh, just for a reference. Okay, so that, that winds down uh, what seismic waves are. Let's look now at how we can use them to actually image Earth's interior in detail. This is a technique called seismic tomography. And it allows us to calculate or, or estimate 
a full three-dimensional velocity structure within Earth. Essentially, this is a CAT scan of Earth, right? And it actually works identical to a CAT scan. Um, what a modeler might do, they might divide Earth's interior into a grid of imaginary three-dimensional cubes, right? That's the model space. And then what happens is over time, earthquakes generate seismic waves at one point on Earth, and they pass through that grid and are measured by seismographs on the surface. And if you know the travel time of many, many hundreds of seismic waves, um, you can solve a system of equations to actually figure out how quickly waves must have passed through each of these model grid cells and effectively solve a system of equations where the result is a velocity estimate for each of those blocks within Earth's interior. So as a result of seismic tomography, we know the velocity structure of Earth. And here's a more detailed look at what that might be. Um, there's a few big jumps in seismic velocity, which are generally due to compositional, compositional or mineralogical changes that control the seismic velocity. So for example, as we come down in depth, we get a huge jump in P wave velocity at the MOHO. Uh, the MOHO is the base of the crust, and it's usually defined seismically. And this is where we pass into the peridotites of the mantle lithosphere. Those peridotites are much denser, and so the seismic velocity jumps way up. So we have a very clear image of where the base of the crust is, or the MOHO. As we come to the base of the mantle lithosphere, we pass through a slight low velocity zone where it's thought that a small amount of partial melt or liquid rock within the mantle is actually reducing the compressibility and the density and slowing those waves down a little bit right in the very uppermost mantle. Things increase again. We get a big velocity jump at about 400 kilometers, which is actually uh, a change in mineralogy. It's where we go from a where olivine is stable, and olivine actually changes form to a mineral called wads, wadsleyite, which is a little bit denser and more compact. So here we've got a big jump in density, uh, essentially due to that, that mineralogical transformation. And the same thing at 670 kilometers. Here, spinel structure collapses into a perovskite mineral structure, again adding a little bit of density and a jump in velocities. So that's a, that's a look at what we can learn from seismic tomography. And here's another, maybe cooler example. Um, this is a tomographic image of the western US. So this is a horizontal slice through Earth's mantle at 200 kilometers depth, okay? And what we see is right below southern Idaho here, this big slow zone where there's a, a slow anomaly where the seismic waves are going slower than they should be, or at least slower than other parts of the mantle. And if we look at that in cross section, uh, from B to B prime here, this is what it looks like with depth. It's this kind of S-shaped uh, zone of lower velocity mantle material. And this is interpreted as a hot spot where hot, buoyant peridotite is rising up from the mantle and fueling the Yellowstone hotspot, these mega volcanoes erupting right out of Yellowstone National Park. Now what's important here is that the reason this hotspot looks slower, that seismic waves pass more slowly through this region, um, is because it is hotter and presumably less dense. So in the mantle context here, we can interpret this, this low velocity anomaly as being due to temperature, um, because we know that all of the rock in the mantle is peridotite. It has essentially the same composition. So if this stuff is passing waves more slowly, it must be because it's hotter, right? Now that contrasts to uh, seismic tomography in the continental crust, for example, where we might see a lot of differences in seismic wave velocity. But instead of being due to temperature changes, they're more likely due to changes in rock type and rock composition. So here's a, an example 
profile of P wave velocities down through the continental crust. This is totally fictional, but somewhat representative. We might have some sediments up on top that have really low density and low velocities. Um, then we might move down through a variety of granites and metamorphic rocks, which all have different densities and different velocities. Um, so in the continental crust, we would probably interpret velocity differences in terms of rock type rather than in terms of temperature. All right, so let's finish this video by looking at seismic refraction, which is a little bit of a variation. Seismic refraction uh, essentially it exploits the fact that um, seismic waves that start at the surface um, tend to be deflected or reflected um, when they hit changes in velocity. Okay, so here's the example. This wave is coming from a, a human-induced explosion, maybe a, a dynamite or a truck or an air gun. It releases seismic waves. It's traveling down through these uh, probably sediments here. And when it hits the bedrock, the vo seismic velocity in the bedrock is going to be faster because it's denser and less compressible. And so the wave actually refracts across that boundary. It actually changes its trajectory a little bit um, due to the difference in, in velocity there. And in some cases, uh, if the angle is low and the change in velocity is high, we actually get a reflection. That wave actually reflects off the velocity boundary and comes back up where we can measure it with a geophone or a seismograph at the surface. Okay. So seismic refraction is a technique where humans tend to detonate synthetic explosions and then measure the waves that are coming back at the surface. And this essentially, and by, by measuring and estimating the depths at which we're getting strong refractions or reflections, we can start to see big jumps in velocity, which tend to correspond to geologic contacts or transitions in the subsurface, such as this one from a, a sedimentary overburden into a, a denser bedrock. So here's an example of a real seismic refraction or reflection image. Um, each of these kind of different colors corresponds to a degree of reflectivity. And we can see a lot of reflections off sedimentary layers in here where the density is changing really rapidly. Maybe you've got a sandstone, a shale, a limestone. As those, those layers have different densities and different velocities, they tend to send a lot of reflections off the sediment layers and back to the surface. Likewise, as we transition from oceanic crust through into the peridotite of the lithospheric mantle, the moho shows up as a pretty strong reflector. Because we're getting a big jump in density and velocity here, um, we get a lot of reflections off that moho, um, which actually show up in the, the refraction image. So in summary, in this video, we've learned that uh, P waves travel by compressing and dilating rock. S waves travel by laterally offsetting rock. Um, and because of that, P waves can travel through liquids and gases, but S waves cannot. Both P and S waves are controlled by things like density, incompressibility, and rigidity of rocks, where denser, more compressible rocks actually pass waves faster. Tomography is a technique that allows us to model the velocity structure of Earth's subsurface and start to make inferences about temperature or rock type or composition in the subsurface. And seismic refraction is a technique where we send down man-made seismic waves which reflect back to the surface, particularly across strong compositional and density boundaries. So I'll leave you with these concept questions, which hopefully you can answer with another review of the video. Thanks, and have a good day.